So hey guys, I'm back for another podcast, a historical podcast, and this one is a little different as I'll be reading. Um, I'll actually be reading it, hopefully, in Virgil Earp's words, and the, hopefully the sound of his voice. Um, this is an, uh, an interview that he had uh, on the train on the night of March 20th, 1882, when Wyatt Earp and his posse killed Frank Stilwell. And Wyatt was outside, obviously, and Virgil was inside the train with Morgan's body as they were headed back to Colton, California. Again, this is an interview with Virgil Earp. I apologize if I blow some of the wording or it doesn't come out right. The vernacular and the way they spoke then was a little different, a lot different than we speak today. So sometimes I'll, I, I might get confused a little bit and I apologize if I do so. Uh, this is a little bit different podcast. I'm trying something different, but I really like this article and I'm hoping to bring it uh, to you and you'll enjoy it as well. This is an interview with Virgil Earp. I went from Prescott to Tombstone as a deputy United States Marshal. The first trouble I had with the Cowboys was when they stole a band of government mules from Camp Ruckner. It was telegraphed from Charleston that the party there was with the mules. I found the party consisted of the McClowry boys, Billy Clanton, Pony Deal. They left before my posse got to Charleston, and we learned from a cowboy named Dave Estel that they had gone to the McClowry Ranch. The mules were branded U.S., and the thieves were changing the brand to D8. When we got to the ranch, we found the brand and also found one of the partners, a man named Frank Patterson and Captain Hurst of Charleston, who accompanied the posse with the four soldiers comprised with Patterson and the later stipulating that he would cause the surrender of the mules if no arrests were made. He stated that bloodshed was sure to follow if the pursuit were to continue and fearing his friends would be killed, promised to deliver the mules back to Charleston the next day. This compromise was made. We went back to Tombstone and Captain Hurst stopping at Charleston to wait for the mules. He waited two days, and on the second day, the McClowries, Clanton, and Patterson rode in and laughed at him, saying they had compromised only to get clear of the Earp party. The mules were never returned. Hurst had caused the printing and posting of some handbills and tombstone describing the stolen mules and mentioning the thieves by name. Billy Clanton and both McClowries came to me and asked if I had had anything to do with advertising them that way. I told them no. Frank McClowry then spoke up and said, if I thought you did, I would make you fight right here. And if you ever follow us as close as you did then, you will have to fight anyways. I answered that if I ever had any warrant for his arrest or put into my hands, I would endeavor to catch him. And no compromise would be made on my part to let him go. He replied that I would have to fight, that I would never take him alive. And I said, Frank, you are not looking for a quarrel, are you? And he said, he had only come in to find out if I had anything to do with the notices and if I had to kill me, but they were satisfied that I had not. Soon after, my brother Wyatt went to work for Wells Fargo as a shotgun messenger on the road between Tombstone and Benson. He worked several months when Morgan took his place. Morg was in six or seven months succeeded by Warren, altogether about a year and a half during which time no box was lost or any trouble experienced. As soon as my brother quit, the cowboys began robbing the stages. At the time, Bud, Pil Bud Philpot was the driver 
who was killed there by four cowboys. Billy Leonard, Jimmy Crane, Harry Head, and a man named King were the robbers. That night, Bob Paul telegraphed to me that the stage had been robbed and one passenger killed and wanted to meet him at Drew's station where the robbery was made. I got Wyatt and Morgan and Bat Masterson, who was ex-sheriff of Fort County, Kansas, to go with me. The night was so dark we could not follow the trail, and we had to lie there until daylight when Sheriff Behan came down. Twenty-five or thirty men offered their services to pursue, and they told them all he wanted was the Ert Boys and Bob Paul. We agreed to go and stay in pursuit as long as he thought it's best to follow them. We struck the trail, followed their footprints for three days, and caught King. He told us who the rest of the party was, and Behan went back to Tombstone with King, and we followed the rest for six days longer before we could get to the place to telegraph for advice. We telegraphed to Behan for fresh horses as hours were played out with their day's work, nine days' work. And Behan met us where we expected to get the horses, but he did not bring them. That night, Bob Paul's horse laid down and died. Wyatt's and Masterson horses were so used up they were left at the ranch and the boys had to hoof it 18 miles to Tombstone. During this time, Hume, Wells Fargo and company detective, had come to work up the case. Wyatt told them that there were about 75 cowboys in town who would try to release King Hume got Wyatt to go with him to the sheriff's office to notify them. And they asked as a favor of the United Sh Under Sheriff to put King in irons. They had promised to do so. And 15 minutes afterwards, King escaped, getting on a horse that was tied to the back of the sheriff's office. After Behan met, we followed the trail for four days more the last five days being without a mouthful to eat and the rest of the two days being without water. The horses were played out and we had to give up the chase and return. Behan brought in a bill against the county for $796.84. We supposed it was to pay for the expenses for the whole party, that he endured it as a private account. I went before the supervisors and they said, Behan must, bow, must vouch for us. This he refused to do, saying we had not disputed us. Everybody but myself and brothers were paid and he did not get a cent until Wells Fargo found it, or actually Wells Fargo had found out and paid us for our time. From that time, our troubles commenced, and the cowboys plotted to kill us. The night of 26th of October last was the first one where Billy Clanton, Frank, and Tom McClowry were killed. Ike Clanton moved his stock onto the ranch of Billy Leonard in Cloverdale, New Mexico, thinking that Leonard would not dare stay in the country after robbing the stage. Soon after, Leonard drove up the ranch and told Clanton that he must buy the ranch or move off. Clanton assented, choosing to buy, saying he would come over to town and get some money, and he came over and hunted up Wyatt and myself. He told me he could fix up a job to get Leonard to come over to the McClowry Ranch where we could capture him, and agreed to furnish evidence to convict him so his ranch would be left for the Clantons. His excuse to get Leonard to McClowry's was that the paymaster was going to Bisbee and when they would waylay him, 
the Clantons and the McLowrys were to get Wells Fargo reward of $1,600 each if they captured and convicted Leonard and his party. They went to the ranch, but Leonard and Crane went to New Mexico, and they were killed by the cowboys. Clanton still holds Leonard's ranch. Clanton and McClary came to us, and they heard that we had revealed the contact to catch Leonard, and they could not live in the country an hour if Leonard's friends had learned that they had plotted against him. That was on the night of October 25th. They got drunk. And on the morning of the 26th, they were still drinking. Ike Clanton swore he would kill the first Earp he met. He had a six-shooter and a Henry rifle, and several friends warned us that I went up the street and found him armed, as I had reported. I grabbed his Henry rifle and took it away. I knocked him down with it, disarmed him, arrested him, and had him fined. Then he went after his brother Bill and the McClowries. They came in armed with Winchesters and six shooters and rode down to Sheriff Bean's livery stables. They began to make threats, saying they would wipe out the Earps. But on that day, and Bean had warned me and asked me what I would do, I answered him that I would disarm them as soon as they came out of the corral and had asked him to go with me. He refused on the ground that if he went, he would have to fight. But he said he would persuade them to disarm. This was all I asked. He was unsuccessful. They said they had come to fight and would not go away without it. I then went to my brothers Wyatt and Morgan and Doc Holliday and asked them to help me disarm the party. At this time, I was a chief of police. Wyatt was the deputy, deputy United States Marshal, and Morgan was an officer under me. Behan was talking to the cowboys when he went down. When he got within 40 or 50 feet of them, Behan saw us and left them coming to us and saying, for God's sakes, don't go near them. You will be murdered. I said, Johnny... I'm going to disarm that party. He said, I have disarmed them. And I said then I would go down and notify them that they must not carry arms on the street or I would have to arrest them and have them fined. I suppose Behan had disarmed them. I did not know different until I had gotten within five feet of them. I demanded their arms and they drew them and commenced firing. We returned fire. There were about 35 fired, excuse me, 35 shots fired in a minute. When the fight was over, Billy Clanton, Frank, and Tom McClowry were killed, and Doc Holliday, Morgan, and myself were wounded. We were arrested on a warrant sworn out by Billy the Kid, the cowboy. Now, this is a different, this is a side note, this is a different Billy the Kid. Um, this is not the same one that you're thinking of. They used to call William Claiborne Billy the Kid. We stood a tedious trial of 30 days. The Cowboys had had about $10,000 and employed some of the best attorneys in the territory to prosecute us. We were acquitted. When Morgan and I got well, reports came in that we would be assassinated at the first opportunity. On the 29th of December, last I stepped out of the Oriental Saloon to go to the hotel when three double-barreled shotguns were turned loose on me from about 65 feet. I was shot in the back and in the left arm. On the 18th of March, Morgan was in the billiard hall playing billiards. He had just stepped back to let his companion companion play when Frank Stillwell and a half-breed named Indian Charlie and Peter Spence fired through the door, hitting Morgan in the back, 
breaking it and killing him. After killing Morgan, they went down to Spence's and talked and laughed it over. On the next day, we sent Morgan to Colton, California to be buried, and on the 20th, I followed. On the road between Tombstone and Contention, we were notified by parties in Tombstone that Ike Clanton, Frank Stilwell, Billy Miller, and another cowboy were watching every train coming through to kill us. They all had shotguns tied under their overcoats. Wyatt, Warren, Doc Holliday, John Johnson, and Shermick McMasters concluded to see me through at Tucson. Almost the first men we met on the platform there were Stillwell and his friends armed to the teeth. They fell back into the crowd as soon as they saw I had an escort and the boys took me to the hotel to, for supper. They put me on the train and I had not seen any of them since. While waiting for the train to move out, a passenger notified me that some men were lying on a flat car next to the engine. Just then the train moved out and immediately the firing commenced. The result of the shooting was the death of Stillwell, who was found on the track the next morning. They said our boys had killed them. One thing is certain. If I had been without an escort, they would have killed me. I had to be lifted in and out of the car. I had not been out of bed before for almost nearly three months. From the time I know only what I have read and are writing the killing of Tombstone, except that Wyatt wrote to me, writing of the killing of Curly Bill in the Whetstone Mountains, about 10 or 12 miles from Tombstone. I killed Curly Bill without a doubt. Curly Bill was the man who killed Frank White, the first city marshal of Tombstone is what Wyatt said. I had heard that my brothers were arrested in Denver and telegraphed there to learn the truth. I afterwards got word from Wyatt that he had not been within 500 miles of Denver. He also said if he could get out on the bonds, he would at once surrender, but did not want to be in jail for six months awaiting trial and that he would return at the first sitting of the court anyways. This is the main story of all the troubles in Tombstone. There are many incidental affairs which have added to them, but they are off more, of, excuse me, of more local than general interest. I will go back to Tombstone as soon as I am able to dress myself. That is the end of the interview. However, it says in the end here in parentheses that Virgil did not in fact return to Tombstone until 1887. And while there, he rode on a posse after some train robbers with old friends, Fred Dodge, uh, Harelip Charlie Smith. He was astounded, one of the passengers, um, he astounded one of the passengers by allowing his boneless left arm to flop in the wind while he crossed an open stretch of desert on horseback. Interesting story nonetheless. Now, if you're interested in more of this kind of history, you can do so by joining the Wild West History Association. They are super easy to find. Uh, you can do so at www.wildwesthistory.org. Memberships are, um, they're, they're not cheap, but they're actually well worth it. Uh, they're $75 a year, $125 for two, and $175 for three. Now, I signed up for this $175 because I saved a lot of money doing a three-year membership. Now, the reason I say they're not cheap is because a lot of money goes into this. This is not a, the journal is not just a magazine and they sell ads for, uh, you know, for to offset the costs. They actually, this is truly researched, deep researched. It's over a quarter inch thick of solid history, and I definitely urge you to look at the Wild West History Association. As always, if you have a comment, 
please leave one. Let me know whether you like this type of thing or not and whether you'd like me to do it again. As always, work safe, be safe.